I believe the topic we're looking at today is vital, but not fashionable. It's even a word that sounds kind of old-fashioned. It's a word to me that brings to mind imagery of the great missionaries of old. You know, those great men and women of God from times past. And in a way, I guess, the fact that this word brings to mind to me people who lived a long time ago suggests to me the church could do with this in greater measure today. And that word is steadfastness. I'm going to read from Psalm 57. Verses 1 to 11, it will be behind me. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge. Till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high. To God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame he who tramples on me. Selah. Incidentally, we'll come back to Selah next week. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts. The children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows and whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be all over the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way. But they have fallen into it themselves. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praise to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. What a wonderful, wonderful psalm that is. And I know they all are. But I love the dynamics and the tensions that are at play in this one. It captures to me the dynamics and tensions that all of us experience in times of life. It's a prayer of David, one where David was on the run. His life was under threat from Saul. And here's David hiding in a cave in a place called En Gedi. Incidentally, if you're going to hide anywhere, En Gedi is a nice place to hide. It's an oasis in the wilderness. It's got waterfalls, caves. It's a nature reserve today. And uh, here's just a picture of me sticking my head in one of the waterfalls of En Gedi. Lovely place. But David really wasn't in the best place to enjoy it. This is one of the worst times in David's life at this point. He has some big troubles And betrayal still to come. But he doesn't know that yet. At this point, this is the worst time in his life. This is the lowest David had ever, ever been. You ever been low? Like, really, really low? Have you ever been on the run for your life because the ruler of the nation wants you dead? No? I think David might win. As challenges go, David had a big one. And David does not hold back in the opening six verses of this psalm. This opening six verses are a cry out to God in a desperate circumstance. Be merciful to me, God. I take shelter in the shadow of your wings until the storms pass by. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts. His soul is laid low and bowed down. The opening of this psalm is a plea to God. God, help me. Listen, don't ever be ashamed of praying that prayer. 
Don't ever be too proud or self-deficient that you can't cry out, Lord, help me. This is a psalm of hope for help. But it's against problems that overwhelm. But something happens. In verse 7, there's a change in David's attitude. There's a change in focus. Verses 7 and 8, he says, My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. And the rest of the psalm from that point on is glory and honor to God. And it's loud glory and honor to God because David says, I'm going to wake the dawn up. I'm going to be that loud. Let me tell you, in the blackest night, in the darkest times, when we praise God, when we set our focus on God, He can awaken the dawn. We can bring an end to the dark situation. We can bring an end to the night because we praise the one who is in the light. Even in the worst of times, you can praise God. And when you praise God, the darkness turns to light. But here's a tip. Here's a tip to that working. If you're going to worship in the dark, sing songs about the light. Don't sing songs about the situation. There's a lot of modern worship songs that focus on our problems, focus on our feelings. Oh, they're so touchy-feely, Lord. The storm is raging all around. Oh, I'm so down. I'm so terribly depressed. Listening to those songs aren't going to make you feel better. When you're in the pit, you need to look up, not in. Those songs have their place, but I tell you, when you're in the pit, look at him and look at how wonderful and amazing and glorious he is. You want to sing about his majesty. You want to sing about his glory because then your heart turns to praise, not introspection. In the darkness, you can get through by believing the one who is the light. David could do it. How well that leads us to today's word. David said, my heart is steadfast, O Lord. My heart is steadfast. David could say steadfast in the worst of times. That declaration moved him to praise instead of despair. What does it mean to be steadfast? And the big question is, can we today, like David, declare, my heart is steadfast, O Lord, my heart is steadfast. The word steadfast in Hebrew is kun. And it means to be fixed. To be firm. Determined. Established. Fixed. David is saying, despite the situation, despite the problems he is facing, his heart is determined. His heart is fixed. His heart is established with God. Now when we talk about the heart, we're not just talking about our emotional life, the way we use it today. Scripturally, the heart is the center of your emotion, your thoughts, your activity, your morality, all of that stuff. So for David to say his heart is steadfast and fixed, he's talking not just about his emotional life, he's talking about his thought life, he's talking about his activity, he's talking about everything that he is. But he is including his emotions in there. When we fix ourselves towards God, When we become determined and steadfast, our situations get new light shed on them. We can praise in the the darkness, knowing he can awaken the dawn. A steadfast heart 
does not waver when situations change. A steadfast heart does not flit between one idea and the other. A steadfast heart is not changed by the mood or the wind. It is fixed. It is committed. It's easy to say you're solid when times are good, isn't it? It would have been very easy for David to declare his heart as steadfast when he was sitting on the throne, living in a big palace, king of all Israel. That would have been easy. But David said it in the darkness. He said it in the cave of despair. Because it's in your times of trial that your steadfastness gets tested. Now this of course begs a question. Great. David said my heart is steadfast. David had a steadfast heart. Wonderful. But does that mean I should? Because it would be very unreasonable to say just because David did something or had something that that should be the standard for all of us. After all, there's plenty of things David did that I don't recommend. It's a good question. So we need to turn back to Scripture, specifically somewhere New Testament, where we are commanded to be steadfast and immovable. Well, funnily enough, there is one. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 to 58. Now I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must be clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, as the saying that is written will come to pass, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and immovable. Always excel in the work of the Lord because you know your labor is not in vain. I know I read a lot of that beforehand, but you can't start with therefore without reading what the therefore is about. You see, if David could be steadfast and we have a greater hope than David, how much more reason have we got to be steadfast? We know what the future holds, that the imperishable is coming. Let me tell you, David didn't know that. We have a hope in the future kingdom of God. We have the gift of eternal life. David didn't know that. Look at what we have coming in the future. Look at what Jesus has given us now. Because of Jesus, we have victory. God has given us the victory over sin, over death. Where is your sting, death? We have in Jesus, what we have, Peter tells us, is something the prophets, the great men of the Old Testament prophesied about, but didn't have. Peter tells us the angels themselves long to look into what we have. See, often we lose track in our lives, we lose hope, we lose focus, we lose steadfastness. Because we forget we forget what we have when we have Jesus. Jesus broke the curse of death. Jesus defeated sin. Jesus gives us a hope and a future. Jesus is building a kingdom that knows no end. And you're part of it. 
You're part of it. We have the fullness. We have the good news that for thousands of years people waited for. Therefore, therefore, be steadfast. Be immovable. Excel in the work of the Lord because your labor is not in vain. Your labor has eternal consequences. You know, even as I've been writing this this week, I've had those doubts come. Lord, am I doing any good? My labor is not in vain because Jesus is on the throne. We can be steadfast because we know what's coming. But more than that, because we know what's coming, we are commanded to be steadfast. Paul doesn't say try to be steadfast and immovable. He says be steadfast and immovable. Is your life a life that's fixed, unchanging, one that's marked by a firm determination? When it comes to the work of the Lord, are you steadfast? Never giving up? The Bible tells us we need to let nothing move us from that position. The steadfast life is the life that firmly plants its feet, stands its ground. A steadfast person doesn't move. When you commit to something, you commit. When you say you're going to do something, you do it. A steadfast person is dependable and reliable and has your back. If you tell someone you've got their back, have their back. Don't abandon them the week after. When you say you're going to do something, do it. We heard a few weeks ago, if you vow to do something, you don't do it, sin. When we look at some of the great men of God in the past, what they all have in common is this immovability, this steadfastness, this resolution. Look at people like John Knox. He would not be moved. I'm sad to say I think that's something that in the modern church is more and more lacking. We have leaders who change their theology more than their underwear. Leaders who give in to temptation. Leaders who just plain give in. It's no longer a surprise when an influential ministry publicly loses their faith. It used to be a shock. Now it's like, oh look, another one. Where are the giants of God? Where are the immovable, steadfast people of God? Isn't it? I don't think I get off scot-free here either. I let my emotions rule my thinking far too much. Amelia knows that. <laughs> I need to take my eyes off how I feel and remember who I am and what I've been given. I must remember I am called to be steadfast and immovable. People of God, we must be people who do not waver. We must be people who can stand firm and declare, my heart is steadfast, O Lord. My heart is steadfast. God is looking for a church and a people who will make a stand and not be shaken by every breeze that life gives them. I wonder this morning, is that something we lack? Have we learned to glory during our infirmities or take glory in our infirmities? Because those two things are extremely different. I believe culturally today there is a pull away from steadfastness and we are encouraged to revel in our infirmities. David said, my heart is fixed. To have a fixed heart, you need a fixed determination, not a fluctuating one. 
You need a steadfast affection for God, not a flighty one. You need to be a spiritual brick, not a spiritual butterfly. We need a continuous realization that we depend completely on God. A steadfast heart has consistency. A flighty heart comes to church when it can be bothered. A flighty heart crumbles in troubles. A steadfast heart glorifies God through them. Let me tell you, the flighty heart and the steadfast heart, the troubles are the same in both scenarios. The troubles aren't any different. The outlook and how you face them is different. This psalm that we read at the start starts with complaints. But it ends with prayers. That's the attitude of a steadfast heart. My soul is in the midst of lions. <laughs> Let him roar. I lie down with the fiery beasts whose tongues are swords and teeth are spears. Let them do their worst because my heart is fixed. I struggle to pay the bills. Some days I just don't want to face people. Everybody's deserted me. I feel so alone. I feel afraid. I feel anxious. Some days I wonder if I want to be here at all. Steadfast heart says, bring it on. My heart is fixed. I'm going to glorify God anyway. Sometimes we can learn a lot about the nature of a word by looking at the opposite of it. For example, when we looked at reverence, looking at irreverence, I thought shone a great light on what reverence is. What's the opposite of steadfast? Well, thanks to Google, I know. <laughs> the opposite of steadfast is fickle, inconstant, undependable, unreliable, weak, random, tentative, Flaky, love that word, and changeable. You see, because we have a hope in heaven, we shouldn't be living like everybody else. Those words should not be a way somebody could describe you. When I think of those great men and women of God, lions of the faith, those words don't apply to them. To the modern Christian? They apply all too much. We're so lost in our situations and our circumstances, hoping that if our circumstances improve, if our situations improve, then, just then, we can find our feet, we can have peace, then we can make ourselves steadfast. It sounds good. That is not how it works. It actually works the other way around. Isaiah 26.3 You will keep in perfect peace those minds who are steadfast. Because they trust in you. When we become fixed on him, when our minds are steadfast, that is when peace comes. Not the other way around. Why? Why? Because those who minds, whose minds are steadfast says, because they trust in God. Perfect peace comes from trusting God. Steadfastness is not situation dependent. Listen to this. The situation is steadfastness dependent. David does not pray in that psalm, God, I'm struggling, make me steadfast. Because this is something God is waiting for you to choose to do. Will he help? Of course. But steadfastness is a choice. It's a decision that comes from you. Not a download that comes from him. This is important. Some of you are praying, God, break my chains. 
God is telling you this morning, they're already broken. He already did it. But you won't let go of them. They're broken. You just need to drop them. Decide. I'm not going to hold on to these anymore. Where are the pillars? Where are the giants of faith today? Where are the people in the church that will not be shaken? Where are those who do not rely on their situation getting better? Don't rely on their talent. Don't rely on their own means. But instead are so fixed and steadfast that their reliance is completely on God and God alone. And I'm not having to go to anyone because I include myself in the problem. We're a fickle, changeable, up and down roller coaster generation today. And God is looking for those who are fixed and immovable and steadfast so that He can use them to change the world. Isn't it this amazing quote from Leonard Ravenhill? And if you don't feel convicted as I read this, believe me, I do. To the question Where is the Lord God of Elijah? We answer, where he has always been, on the throne. But where are the Elijahs of God? We know Elijah was a man of like passions as we are, but alas, we are not men of prayer as he was. One praying man stands as a majority with God. Today, God is bypassing men, not because they're too ignorant, but because they're too self-sufficient. Brethren, our abilities are like our handicaps and our talents, our stumbling blocks. Ah, brother preachers, we love the old saints, missionaries, martyrs, reformers, our Luthers, Bunyans, Wesleys, Asbury's, etc., We will write their biographies, reverence their memories, frame their epitaphs, and build their monuments. Can I add here, by the way, quote them on social media. We will do anything except imitate them. We cherish the last drop of their blood, but carefully watch the first drop of our own. Oh, for a steadfast heart. Oh, for a life that can declare in the midst of trouble, my heart is steadfast, God. My heart is steadfast. But as we wrap up, I just want us to realize two things. First of all, that's a good impulse to have. It's a good desire to have. It's a good prayer to pray. Psalm 119 says, Oh, that my ways may be steadfast. By the way, for those of you taking notes when I said wrapping up, that's ages off. (laughs) Oh, that my ways might be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then... I shall not be put to shame. Having my eyes fixed on all your commandments, I will praise you with an upright heart. When I learn your righteous rules, I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. See, Aleph was asking that same thing. He was praying that same prayer. Oh, God, that that my ways might be steadfast. He saw his lack. He knew his life didn't measure up. He knew his ways were not as they were supposed to be. I find that hugely encouraging because it means it's not just me. It's not just us. He starts by saying, oh, that my ways will be steadfast in keeping your statutes. But here's the key. In verse 7, he says, I will praise you with an upright heart. When I learn your righteous rules. In other words, the word, the law of God. A steadfast heart seeks out the word of God. The law of God. A steadfast heart praises in all circumstances. And a heart that praises in all circumstances is a steadfast heart. 
Let me tell you, a steadfast heart is a good thing to desire, but desire alone is not enough. It takes a decision that you are going to praise God no matter what happens. No matter what. That you choose to be fixed, to be focused, to be determined, and you will not be shaken. That begs the question, doesn't it? What about when we get shaken? <laughs> what if our hearts that were fixed find themselves knocked? Are we sin? Is that it? Are we done? Can we no longer say, my heart is steadfast? If you've been flaky, if you've let God down, are you in a place where God looks at you and says, well, that one's not steadfast? Is steadfast something you can lose? And if it is, is it something you can regain? Because let's be honest. We all fail, don't we? All of us. Well, David, who proclaimed his heart as steadfast, failed. He got off track. He sinned and found himself once again in a very dark place. Actually, a darker place this time. Because this time it was his fault. And his own son died as a result of it. Listen to what David writes in Psalm 51 after the incident with Bathsheba. Psalm 51, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. That word in verse 10, by the way, right spirit within me. That also translates as a steadfast spirit within me. In other words, David, who was at this point in one of the worst moments of his life again, was able to turn despair into glory because his heart was steadfast. Found himself in a place now where David had royally messed up. I say royally messed up because he messed up in a way only a king could mess up. He messed up so bad. This man after God's own heart, this man anointed by God, got his hands dirty. He flaked out. He became unreliable and he sinned. And his prayer is create in me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. David lost his steadfastness. And his prayer is God. Bring it back. I tell you this morning if you mess up. If you've gotten off track. If your steadfastness comes off the rails and goes to a crashing halt. Have hope. Because God is the God of restoration. Pick yourself up and make a decision. Make a decision. Tomorrow will not be like yesterday. Tomorrow will be different. God's willing to help you along the way, but he's waiting for you to make the choice. Fix your heart. Fix your mind on Jesus. Because Jesus has the victory. And when we forget that, we run into trouble. 
There is nothing going on in your life today that Jesus cannot defeat. Nothing. It's when we forget that, our problems overwhelm us. I don't know what you're facing today. Let me tell you, I'm sure everybody's facing something. But I know that I know that I know Jesus can defeat it. If you need to, repent. You are part of a kingdom that will know no end. Therefore, be steadfast and immovable. When dark times come, praise the name of Jesus. Praise God through it and make such a noise you'll awaken the dawn. Because you might let him down. Let me tell you, he will never let you down. Lamentations 3.22. You can't do steadfastness without this verse. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. New every morning. Oh dear. Great is your faithfulness. He is the model of steadfast love. His love never, never, never ceases. His love is fixed. His love is determined. His love is immovable. His mercies are new to us every day. Every day you wake up, he's got new mercies for you. And thank God for that, because every day we wake up, we need new mercy. To be steadfast is a decision we make. But it is not one that's dictated by our circumstances. In the cave of Adullam, David chose praise over despair. His heart was steadfast. Church, we need to be people like that. That in hard times we choose praise over despair. You know, it's harder to knock down a tree with deep roots. The wind can certainly make a bend. But it will stand firm if its roots are strong enough and deep enough. It only really gets uprooted in a storm if its roots were too shallow. How rooted is your faith? How rooted are you to him? How rooted are you to the community of faith that God gave you? That's just me rambling about saying how rooted are you in church. I don't know about you. I'm sick of the roller coaster. Sick of it. Up and down and up and down and left and right and blah. Because a roller coaster only makes you feel sick. That's not what I want in my life. And I know that's not what God wants of my life. But I can't wait for God to do it. Because he's waiting for me to decide it. Now understand this morning I'm presenting to you a target. Not a standard. You shouldn't feel condemned if you don't reach the target. But I believe it's a reachable target. Oh, to say my heart is steadfast, Lord, my heart is steadfast. That I will be solid, I will be fixed, I will be unwavering and unmoving. In many ways, it's a similar word to that patience we heard about in Pew Talks this week. Steadfastness keeps on going, even when it's tough. A steadfast life is a life of peace. A steadfast life is a life of prayers. God wants his people to be steadfast people because God can do great things with steadfast people. And the challenge I want to lay before all of us this morning is a simple one. 
Make a choice. Let's choose to be steadfast. Let's make the choice that we will stand no matter what. Let's make the choice that we will never waver and that our Lord God will help us each and every step of the way. Church, let's make a choice that tomorrow will be different than yesterday. In the darkness, make the choice to praise and not despair. Because we are lights in the world. But you know what one of the most annoying things is? A light that keeps on flickering. It gives you a headache. Let's not be flickering. Let's not be dim. But let's shine brightly so that people can see God and glorify him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.